So thank you everybody for coming tonight. My name is Don Morrill and I'm the exec Executive Director here of the New York Technology Council. Uh, welcome to uh, Too Big to Know where we talk about a very interesting topic, perhaps not directly related to technology, but there's technology underpinnings certainly in the topic, very very germane to, uh, uh, to tonight's uh, event. A uh, couple quick housekeeping items. I'd like to give a quick thanks to our 2012 sponsors, the accounting firm of Eisner Amper, Google, uh, TGP Associates, Verizon, Information Builders, and two new sponsors for 2012, uh, IBM, and of course, uh, Frankfurt Kernick. I'd also like to give an extra special thanks tonight to Frankfurt Kernick for uh, hosting this wonderful event for the food and the drinks that you're enjoying and also for the great venue. And that's all I have, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to David uh, for Too Big to Know, and uh, the, the floor is yours. You all have your, his bio in the... Uh, uh, in the program, so I won't go into any detail and just give us one quick second while we switch laptops here. We go. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> thank you very much for coming out. Uh, amazing group of, set of groups of people all in one room. Um, I did bring a tie. <laughs> Don told me I don't have to wear it. I will if, uh, if you want to crowdsource this decision, I'll put it on afterwards or whatever. But, um, so, uh, Something um, peculiar and possibly disturbing is happening. That, um, if you look at the big um, symbols of knowledge in our culture, the sort of physical manifestations of knowledge, things like, say, encyclopedias, where you were, in my generation, if you had the physical encyclopedia in your house, that was a mark that your family cared about knowledge. Encyclopedias are, in one way or another, they're dissolving, falling over, they're in deep trouble, as we all know. Um, or newspapers, which traditionally have been um, a symbol of a well-informed democracy. They're getting disaggregated, they're getting re-aggregated, they're just... Um, and nobody knows what's going to happen. This is nobody knows. And likewise, in the library world, which um, I've actually been in for now for a couple of years, um, the same thing. Every librarian is concerned about what's going to happen to libraries. Here we have large physical buildings in communities. They look like Greek temples typically and they are an embodiment of the community's commitment to knowledge. And we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know if they're gonna be there or what the space is gonna be used for. So you take the things that are the most <laughs> solid representations of our commitment to knowledge, the instantiation of knowledge, and suddenly over the past 15 years, in just 15 years, these are old institutions, <laughs> in just 15 years, and, they're, they're gone, they're on their way out, they're transforming, they're at, at issue. It's pretty serious. Something important is going on with knowledge. And they fell over at the touch of a very small bit of technology, which is granted embedded in a much bigger one, but a hyperlink. It's basically links that have done this, just a little thing, and, and massive institutions now are in question, at issue. So it's sort of interesting to ask, why, why did this happen? Who would have predicted that over the course of 15 years, these majors, I, nobody <coughs> would have, I don't think, um, and yet it's been happening. This is particularly important because knowledge in the West, and I'm only talking about the West um, in this, um, knowledge in the West has made a particularly important promise to us, which is embodied in this uh, quotation from Senator Moynihan, um, which is everybody, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, not his own facts. And this quotation is coming up more and more, and I think it's because it's responding to a fear. And it makes, it's comforting, it makes a certain uh, comforting promise, which is, that, which is a very old promise of knowledge, which is lots of different opinions, but we can all come together if we just pay attention to the facts, we engage in the processes of knowledge, and we can, we can come together, reasonable people. Knowledge will rescue us from the chaos and dissension that we see around us. That's been, that is an, old pro, an ancient promise of knowledge reinforced by the Enlightenment. And so knowledge is very important. It's making, it has made this claim, which now I think may also be an issue. So very quickly, because we all know what knowledge has been, um, what has it been? Well, it, you know, in one sense we have taken knowledge as being a representation of the world of a particular sort. It's, we do it step by step. We, we, um, we discover facts and uh, so you can tell the, uh, the um, what do you call it, the 
aspect angle. Ratio, aspect, ratio. aspect ratio is slightly off, but you'll have to, within, um, by the time I hit about hour two and a half, your brains will start compensating for the aspect ratio and that will look like a circle. We're on slide 213. Something to look forward to. So, um, knowledge is a representation of the world. It's a built up step by step, whether it's by facts or steps of logic. Um, in which we nail, and yes, this is the third metaphor in a row, so I'm wildly mixing metaphors, <laughs> without apology. Each of these steps, each of these bricks is nailed down, it's settled. Knowledge is something that is settled bit by bit as we build up this picture of the world. And it has, from the very beginning of knowledge, which conventionally is traced you know, to, the, to the ancient Greeks, to Athens, it's been a matter of winnowing, that whether it's um, winnowing through the, the uh, excuse me, the onrush and chaos of, of chaos of sensation or of the sort of noise of all of the mob that has so many different opinions you need to figure out which one is true and worthy of belief, justified true belief, Plato's uh, definition which has stood, stood with us for 2,500 years, knowledge has been a type of winnowing. Most, which implies most of what we see, most of what we hear is not knowledge and it's a, up to us to, to filter and to find out. So we have devised strategies to deal with what has been the most basic fact from the very beginning, which is the world, we have understood, the world is way bigger than our skulls. Our, and, and our skulls simply don't scale. As we learn more and more, <laughs> our, scales don't get, our skulls don't get any bigger. And we've known that from the beginning, and so we've devised a set of strategies for dealing with it. Um, and pretty successfully, I would say. So one of the key strategies is to enable people to break off a brain-sized chunk of the world and then to know it thoroughly, to master it. Um, there's a whole gender politics around mastery. So um, break off a brain-sized chunk of the world, know it thoroughly, master it, and become an expert. So that we can go to the experts or the books that they write or encyclopedia articles, we can go to them with questions, we can ask a question, and we can get an answer. And the important thing is, the brilliance of the system is that we can then stop asking. If we don't trust the expert, we don't think, that, we have a backup system uh, of credentials. And so we say, uh, I don't think that, oh, I see, you've got a degree from wherever, uh, okay, now, or you wrote the book, and I, I didn't know that. So we have, we've devised knowledge as a series of stopping points. It's a system of stopping points with a backup system of stopping points called credentials. And that's where the efficiency of the system comes from. The fact that you can ask a question, be quite confident in most cases that you're getting a good answer. And stop asking. You don't have to redo the research. You don't have to redo the experiment. You've got your answer. You can move on, develop new knowledge, apply the knowledge, and so forth. This is an amazingly productive system, an amazingly efficient system that's made us the dominant species on the planet. So it works really, really well. But what we should be aware of is that this, is, this idea of knowledge is not natural. It's not how knowledge itself is. It's how knowledge is when its medium is paper. And paper is wonderful. We all love paper. We all love books. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to bother defending books because, you know, we all love books. At least we say we do. Nevertheless, books are great at some things and really, really bad at some others. Books are profoundly small. Libraries are tiny. Most of the world's books don't fit into any library. Libraries don't scale. Books don't scale. They get big enough to cover the topic. Every author who ha leaves out more than she or he puts in. You carefully think about what the reader needs because books are so disconnected that you know you have to give the reader everything she needs within this volume because there's no real possibility she's going to get interested, want to pursue it outside the book, put the book down, get on a bus, go to the big city, go to the big library, hope that the book is there, go to the shelf and it's not there. You know the reader's not going to do that except in the most extraordinary cases, which is to say basically never. We don't do that. You don't do that. I don't do that. Researchers don't do that. Books are stopping points. And they have, of course they come out of the social milieu. Of course they come out of that. They're not invented by people living alone in steamer trunks. Or, you know, they come out of a culture, of course. Uh, and they make reference to that culture. And they have footnotes to that culture. But footnotes are stopping points too. It's very, very rare, even for the most dedicated researcher, to actually look up the work in the footnote. It happens. 
but it's rare. Generally, when we consult a footnote, it's to make, we, we wonder about something on the test, and like a credential, we look at the footnote and say, ah, I see, it came from wherever, and we stop. So even the links within paper books are usually operating as stopping points. Knowledge, it's not an accident that knowledge is that way. It's reflecting the limitations and the strengths of the medium that it has, and it's had paper. And so books, paper are, uh, I mean, books and libraries are, they're a representation of the world. It's stuck between covers, but it's some representation of the world that are highly filtered. Very few works make it through the initial filter of getting published, and once you're writing it, you are removing everything that doesn't get your reader from the starting point to the end point. Anything that gets in the way, even if it's highly entertaining and diverting or, or enlightening, doesn't help the reader get to the conclusion, it's got to go. His books are so small. Um, once you publish a book, the ink's on the paper. It's not coming off the paper. It's just not. And so it's settled. You better be, books are an establishment of, of a stand. And so knowledge also is about, in the West has been about settling things. We, we don't say that something is knowledge until we, most people have agreed about it. Or put differently, until we've marginalized those who disagree about it. And books are, because of their uh, page nature, they work more or less in a series of steps. That's how you write a book. This is not a requirement. It's not like a paper god said, you must work. But this is the way it's developed in our culture, that we take the series of pages as sequential, and we expect a series of steps that will lead the reader along through the path, on, on the path, keep the reader on the tour bus until it's over. So books have re knowledge has been... Um, conditioned by the medium that we've had for it, for all of that medium strengths. Now, of course, we have a new medium, we have a new infrastructure for knowledge, a digital one, and you can think about links as being a new type of punctuation. So the old types of punctuation tell you where to stop, links tell you how to continue, and in fact make it possible to continue, like the magic map we have dreamed of in, in, our, in our myths, the map that you can touch and you go to where um, to the location on the map. In fact, we now, it's now takes the smallest imaginable human movement, which is that, in order to traverse what otherwise would have required buses and, and crawling through stacks and libraries. Just the smallest movement, and you are now at the source, reading the new material that it has come to you. This is clearly a hugely connective medium. And so I want to talk tonight about four characteristics of the internet that I think are being taken up by knowledge. Um, I'm going to be, uh, as fast as I, as I can, incomplete, and I want to come back to the question I posed at the beginning um, and, and quite dramatically fail to answer it. So that's my, that's my <laughs> program for tonight. So the first property of the internet being absorbed by knowledge is that the internet has near infinite, I know near infinite is not an actual meaningful phrase, but you know, tons and tons, we don't know how much, it's got a lot of capacity. I, you're techies, you're gonna, I know somebody's gonna you know, jump on me for that, damn techies. And I was told that you're gonna be wearing black t-shirts. Don, who said that? Uh, oh, where's Joey, where's Joey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, way, way more capacity than printed systems ever had. So Clay Jerky, who I'm sure is familiar to, to all of you, a few months ago said this typically brilliant thing, uh, there's no such thing as information overload, there's only filter failure, which I think is exactly right. Um, and Clay is, I, um, I believe, in this, trying to give us some historical perspective that we've often in our history felt that there's too much, but really we just have to adjust our filters. There's always too much, Throughout all of human life, there's always too much information, but usually the filters are okay. So um, he's saying, I believe, don't freak out about this information overload. It's going to be okay. We're going to get the filters right. Um, Anne Blair has a book called, it came out six months before mine. <clears throat> mine is called uh, Too Big to Know. Hers is called Too Much to Know. <laughs> Not at all confusing. <laughs> but if you get them confused, you'll actually do better with hers. She, uh, Amaz an amazing scholar and expert. Um, so at times in this talk, you, you may think that I don't like experts. That's because I'm not communicating very well. 
Um, and Blair is uh, an example of the sort of expert that we we would be so we would be impoverished without scholars like like Blair. Um, also a very kind person, which is nice. Um, so she has a book called Too Much to Know, which is a very careful look at um, in information overload throughout history, um, and in particular around the printing press. It's really brilliant. So yes, uh, continuity, some comfort, we shouldn't freak out, that's true, but I want to point out two um, discontinuities, while accepting the important continuities, two discontinuities um, in the current information overload environment. Uh, so here's the first. This is, um, this is the guy, uh, Alvin Toffler, who, who um, popularized the phrase information overload. He didn't create it, but 1970, really good book, holds up very nicely. Um, he injected it into the popular culture. It was a huge bestseller. Um, and he correctly traces the term back to the prior term, which was sensory overload, which came about in about 1950. The idea was, as I'm sure you know, that you're uh, in a Grateful, Grateful Dead concert where there's too much noise and the smells and the sounds, your sensory circuits get overloaded and you will fall down and, and twitch and sort of have a seizure. <laughs> and so once we made the historical mistake of thinking of, of, re, of thinking of everything as being information, including the human brain, uh, we made a, a comparison, um, which was, well, there's sensory overload, there's got to be something called information overload, and it has the same sort of effect, that if too much information, uh, and you will, again, have diminished capacity, <coughs> fall down. In, in fact, Toffler says sanity, <coughs> excuse me, sanity hangs upon avoiding information overload. This is 1970. Uh, sensory overload really took off as a phrase in the 1960s, and if you look up the usages, seems to mainly be used to frighten parents about their children's drug use. <laughs> Just an historical note. So what did information overload look like in 1970. So Toffler popularizes the notion. 1974, some marketers write a paper. They do some research. They ask. They show 192 housewives, 16 brands, and each of the items has a label with 16 categories on it. And those categories are themselves reduced so that um, it's not uh, 120 calories. It's um, a binary pair. It's either high calorie or low calorie. And the marketers discovered that if you gave the, these poor housewives this much information, their ability to make good decisions went down. This was information overload. 16 categories for 16 brands was considered to be information overload when the term was popular, when it firm, first became popular. We look at this, and this is not in the universe of information overload. This has nothing to do. This is, this is nothing. So the first discontinuity is, yeah, we've always had a sense of information overload. Seneca complains about, this, you know, basically around the year zero, uh, complains about there being too many books. You know, this is Seneca. This is, he, that in, you, we can call that, there's a good reason to think about that as information overload, but it has nothing to do with what we now experience and think of as information overload. The quantity is so much higher. Second um, discontinuity has to do with filters. Because yes, filter failure. That's when we feel the overload. But the nature of filters has changed in the digital age in a, a I, I think, a profound and important way. So when you filter things in the real world, traditionally, uh, you filter things out. You remove things. You take them away, you don't see them. They're the dregs. We have a word for it. It's the dregs, and you throw them out. So if you're filtering uh, let's say you are uh, on the committee for acquiring books for your public library. And you do a good job and you have a nice shelf and people come in and they're all very happy to see, oh, exciting new books, it's great. What people do not see is a million books were published last year in this country. They don't see the rest of that million being carted away from the library and put onto long black trucks that slowly rumble away in sadness and shame. People don't see that. All they see is the handful, relative handful of books that you bought and they thank you for it. That's traditional filtering. We remove that which is filtered out. We filter out. Digitally, we don't do that. That's not how filtering works online. Uh, digitally, what we do is um, you come up with your recommended um, business articles of the week, and you do it on your blog or whatever. It's 10, 10 posts, and you put in the links to them. 
Or that's, that's how you filter now, right? And all that you've done when you've done that is to shorten the number of clicks that it takes to get to those 10 things. You haven't removed anybody else's work. You know, your article didn't make that person's list. Well, I'm sorry, that's too bad, but your article is still there on the web for anybody who wants to read it. It's not like the article that 30 years ago we might have submitted to a publisher who rejects it and we take it away and nobody ever knows about it. Nobody can ever find it. It's just not there. Now, it didn't make this list. We'll make the next list. It'll show up in a search. It'll show up. It'll get passed around in, in email or in a social networking or whatever. It's all still there. It just takes a few more clicks to get there. That is a very different sense of, pr of, of the presence of this massive overload of information and ideas and, and knowledge. And furthermore, the search engines have every economic, every, excuse me, every economic reason to keep telling us how much they're not showing us. It's the exact opposite. They benefit by saying, and we're not showing you over three million results. <laughs> so it is constantly in our face. We are now far more aware of what before was hidden from us. So this results in a different basic strategy that we see is all over the place. It's quite common. I mean, the old idea was that all the value is in the curation. We're so limited. The shelf is only this big in the library or whatever, but it's, you know, it's a finite size and it's small, so you've got to curate well, make good decisions. It's, that's a wonderful thing. It's a very valuable thing. But when you have infinite capacity, near infinite, whatever that means, then you, a different strategy becomes more valuable, I think, which is include everything. When in doubt, include it. So everything in quotes, but include everything. The economics of deletion have changed so radically that it's now cheaper to include than to delete. Deletion is expensive. You have to go through and make decisions. That's why people's hard drives are filled up with, with photos from their camera that are called uh, DSC102796 JPEG. And they never look at it because <laughs> deleting is expensive. So include it all. And there's a good reason to include it all besides sort of uh, the economics of it. It's, when you curate, when you make decisions about what goes into a collection, you are deciding what you are trying to anticipate your users' needs, which is you can do well or badly, and you can do very well, but you can't do as well as your users can. So if you were curating a collection of newspaper articles, um, you would very likely leave out all the trashy, junky ones, the gossip and celebrities and the Lindsay Lohans and all the rest of it, but then you would have just deprive the scholars of their primary research material because they're studying the media's treatment of women celebrities. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a field of study doing this. There's a conference, and you just killed it. Thank you very much, because you didn't think it was important. You cannot anticipate what is going to be important to people. We're just squirreling. We just, you know, we're interested in all sorts of crazy, weird things, and you can't predict it. The second thing you can't predict is history. So if it's 2007 and you're curating your news collection, you probably, well, I'm sorry, but it's, it's 1996, you probably would not include the notes from the meeting of the library committee in Wasilla, Alaska. Because that's just, you know, that's probably not going to make your cut for National News Archives. You couldn't know that in 2008 those notes would actually be pretty interesting. It's not because you're not smart, it's because history is unpredictable. You could not have predicted that uh, those notes would become interesting. But now you don't have to include everything, every, everything that you can. But if you do that, you have to give people tools by which they can filter on the way out, rather than you filtering on the way in. People need tools to filter on the way out. And you can read the history, a big chunk of the history of the web as the rapid development, the amazingly rapid development of tools that allow people to, to do exactly that. End users to look through enormous masses of information, um, searching through them in ways that suit their way of organizing. Um, I actually have, this is a group I can ask. How many of you um, were, say, in the information retrieval industry in the 1980s or early 1990s? There are a number of you here. Um, I was on the edges of this industry as well, and we were struggling. We were very proud that our search engine um, in the early 90s was able to search over 100,000 pages. Yep, you heard me, over 100,000 pages. <coughs> At that point, the idea that users without training or experience would be able to go through the amount of material we now do and with so effectively and with such good results, not possible. We, we would have said everybody would have to become an IR expert. They're going to have to go to school. 
the progress is astounding. And I'm not going to spend any time on the history of the, because you know, um, it wouldn't, you know, you know all that stuff. You know there's been huge development in that area. So the next characteristic of, of the internet that I think knowledge is taking on is the internet's a big stinking mess. It has no central organizing <laughs> principle. Well, it's a strength. Right? I'm totally in favor of that, but we'll get to that. So we are very, very good at organizing things. We're really, we're, we're amazingly good at it. And we do it not just so we can find things, which is you know, an important reason, but for most of our civilization's history, we've done it because we believe that to know what something is is to know its place in the order of the universe. That's what knowledge has been for 2,500 years. Since the term knowledge was invented, well, that's not quite true. Since the concept of knowledge arose in ancient Greece, knowledge has been assumed to be about the uh, essence of things, um, not the details about the particulars, but what makes this a bird. So that's a universal essence. That universal essence was understood as uh, more or less a definition that explained exactly its position in relation to all other created, uh, all other things in the universe. So to know what a bird is is to know how it's like other birds in its category, what the essential likeness is, which is it's, it's, a, it's, it's a feathered biped, right? and how it's different from other objects, other things in its... Um, right? So it's a system of, of similarity and difference. This comes straight out of Aristotle. It's an amazing system, and we have pursued it with the, with the full belief that the job of humans was to the highest calling of humans. What, what's our essence? Rational animals, the knowers. That's our job is to know things. And to know something is to see its place in the order of the universe. 2,500 years pursuing this. This makes complete sense when you're talking about physical objects. Physical objects have only one place. Everything has to be in some place physically. And it can only be in one place, and no two things can be in the same place at the same time. It's, it's just like the order of the universe, except that it's with physical objects. So that when you and your spouse are arguing about how to organize your CDs, you want to do it alphabetically, and your spouse wants to do it by genre or whatever, <laughs> only one of you can win. You can't do it both ways. That's how the real world works, and we have imported that limitation into our understanding of knowledge of the order, the single order of the universe, as if the universe had to have a single order. And to deny that there was a single order was to, was to declare yourself insane, to be a nihilist, to say that there is no, there's no order in the universe. And, by the way, God is dead. That was a serious claim to have made until very recently. So now what we do in the physical world, uh, sorry, now what we do with uh, recordings, if they are digital, is we make playlists. So you and your, you and your spouse are arguing, fine, each make your own play, make multiple playlists, organize them by mood, by, by color of the cover, it doesn't matter. As many different ways as you want. The more, the better. You can find things more easily, you'll see relationships you hadn't seen. In fact, do it globally. Let's have billions of playlists. We have billions of playlists operating over the same set of materials simultaneously. This is a mess. It's a, put them together, you have a huge nightmare of a mess compared to how we thought the universe was supposed to be ordered. But we all know this is, they're useful individually, and together they add layers and layers of meaning. In fact, the notion that there is a single order of universe in, in an age in which we tag things, we multiply categorize them, we, we like to have things in as many different categories as possible, the notion that there has to be a single order just seems quaint. It, limiting. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you think there's a order? And so, talking about this, even just 15 years after the growth of the internet, it already the order that there is an order of the universe seems to most people a crazy idea. It was the foundational idea of our civilization, but now it just seems like crazy limited idea. I think this is, this is wonderful. I, it's not only the internet that has led us to this notion, by the way. I mean, the postmodernists have been talking about all this stuff before there was the physical implementation of it in the internet. Um, nevertheless, I think overall this is, this is really good for us because messiness is how you scale meaning. That's the only way to get all of the meaning out is to acknowledge it's going to be one stinking mess, messy pile. 
The third characteristic of knowledge, I think, is picking up from the internet. And somebody someday will explain to me why Keynote seemingly randomly pops up the slide number. OK, we'll come back to that. <laughs> I, I can't figure out what the uh, uh, it's buggy you guys all of life is. That's a very important point, and perhaps at the end I will ask a question. Please do. Uh, very important, very good, just so far not come up with OK, well, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> OK, so um, the internet is full of unsettled ideas and knowledge. In fact, um, for, every, for every fact on the internet, there is an equal and opposite <laughs> fact. Now, I want to be careful. I am certainly not saying that all facts, all, all purported facts are true. Some facts, some things that seem like facts are not. There are things that are true. There are things that are false. I am not a nihilist. I'm not even much of a relativist. I, I like facts. Nevertheless, if you go out on the internet, look up any fact, you'll find somebody who denies it. Uh, so people, anybody who goes on the internet for any period, I think, comes to this conclusion that we don't agree about anything. We don't agree about anything, and we never will. The never will, my evidence for that is all of human history. We will <laughs> never agree about anything. Some people are going to, let me put this differently, some people are going to insist upon being wrong, and there's nothing that we can do <laughs> to get them to see. Truth exists, we're just not going to agree about it. And this is a very unsettling uh, fact. In fact, it, it's, the, it's the refutation and this is very disturbing. I think we need to take it seriously. It's the refutation of the repudiation of the hope that Moynihan's, Moynihan has expressed. The Enlightenment promised us that knowledge would, we could come together. If we just sat down, and we could come together and, and knowledge will unite us. The, the sad irony is that this quotation from Moynihan it's unattributed. We're not sure who actually said it or what the exact quote is. <laughs> so the good side of this, the hopeful side of it, is just as over the past 15 years we've seen an amazing rapid evolution of tools for filtering, we've also seen similar evolution in uh, tools and techniques for dealing with the fact of disagreement that we can no longer avoid. We used to be able to avoid it because we only heard from a tiny, through a tiny aperture. The, the media through which we got our, uh, was, was small and tightly controlled. So the voices of disagreement, many of whom are, in fact, tinfoil hat-wearing crazy people, but not all of them, those voices were not, simply we could not hear them. Now we can. So we've gotten much better at dealing with um, disagreement. And I want to point to a, very quickly to a couple of ways. Um, so this is actually a terrible example of what I uh, have in mind, which is simply forking. That forking is a really good way of enabling difference to continue without having it disrupt everything. So this is uh, the Batman trailer at YouTube from last week. A lot of views, a lot of comments. YouTube is not a particularly good conversation space, sort of famous for having a, you know, crappy conversations or people just post things. You know, it's not a great conversation space. So um, last week, just a couple pages back from the front page, there was a stream of about 30 back and forth comments from two people who were arguing over the health benefits of circumcision. <laughs> now, it's not exactly clear how this conversation came up on the Batman trailer site, um, but it sure took off and it started getting, they're pretty learned and yet pretty nasty at the same time, these two, two, two people going back and forth. So this is a bad example because if in a more reasonable conversation space, um, you would be able to fork this conversation, say to the people, you know what, you want to talk about this, go over here and talk about, anybody wants to listen, that's fine, but we want to talk about Batman over here. <laughs> YouTube's not good at that, but lots of places on the net are good at it. It is very difficult to fork in the real world, so that if you have you know, eight people at the dinner table of, and talking about Batman and two of them want to talk about circumcision, it's very hard to tell those two, uh, Go over to another table and, and talk. That's a difficult thing to do. Online, it's really easy. And it's a way of enabling us to continue even while supporting difference and disagreement. So forking. I, mean, I know it's very obvious. I just want to remind you, this is actually a remarkable thing. Yes, the impossible object, the platypus. So, in the 19, so another technique. It's, uh, I'll give you the surprise ending. It's namespaces. 
Um, we spent a lot of time in the 19th century arguing about whether what what how to categorize this thing. In fact, um, in some cases, denying that it could exist because it crossed categories. It was a <laughs> mammal that laid eggs. And so when a dead one was finally delivered to scientists in, in England, many of them assumed it was a hoax. Somebody took one of these weird things and shoved some eggs in it. They could not believe it was real. So we spent a lot of time having this classification argument because that's, where, that's what knowledge was about. Where in the order does this go? We don't have those arguments nearly as much. Uh, we still have lots of arguments about and disagreements about how to categorize and classify. Uh, those are serious, some serious disagreements. Nevertheless, at the Encyclopedia of Life, which is a really wonderful site, um, every species gets its, own, gets its own page. I'm sure I put that wrong, but that's basically the idea. They have two servers. They have two databases. One is a nomenclature database, and it wants to know every name for every species. The scientific names, the, uh, the uh, ordinary language names, whatever. They want it all. And so when you go and you want to get some information about this thing, you can use whatever name you want. They're not going to say, well, it's not really a water mole, you know, it's really a platypus. <laughs> they just use whatever name you want, we'll turn it up. Likewise, they have a database of taxonomies. And you say, well, I, I like to see, I think it's classified this way, using this, great, they'll show it to you within that taxonomy. So this, in other words, I have a set of namespaces <laughs> within which um, objects have a consistent set of names that are different from the names in other spaces, other namespaces, but they can map the two, and so you don't have to have the dumb argument, and sometimes it, it's not always a dumb argument, but sometimes it is. You don't have to have the dumb argument about names or taxonomies. You can at least know that you're all talking about this thing over here, even though you call it different things. This is a source of great, you can collaborate getting past some of the needless disagreements. So, <clears throat> yay for difference. The net has value only because there's so much difference and disagreement and so many different points of view. Yay, difference. But, the net may look like that, but it looks like this in our experience. Many different types of people, but we apparently tend to hang out with people who are like us. And I don't just mean ethnically, racially, and gender, but people whose beliefs are like ours. And this is the famous echo chamber argument, which is formulated most, most associated um, with, uh, oh God, what's his name? We'll come back as I have an elderly moment. Um, in, uh, in the book Republic.com, for example, surely somebody here has a device that's connected to the internet. <laughs> you don't want to be rude and use it now. No, you would help a floundering speaker. <laughs> it's just embarrassing. Um, anyway. Um, the echo chamber idea, is, the fear is that when people have as many choices as they do on the internet, what they, who they want to hang out with, what beliefs they want to hang out with, they will choose the ones that are like their own, and this has the effect of further hardening their beliefs. Rather than opening them up to more opinion, it will close them down, and even worse, there's evidence that it will drive, drive people to further extremes. They will, it, we will become more and more polarized. So this is a long, complex argument, and I, I, um, it's, I don't want to have it. It's just too long and complex. And I, I, so I'm going to just flounder for a moment, um, not just on the guy's name, which is just embarrassing, um, but also on the topic. So Overton? No, not no, Overton. Not. Oh, okay. I, sorry, I, I shouldn't be making fun of the person who's helping me. <laughs> Perhaps that's not called for. Um, Re Republic.com is his book. He's in the Obama White House now. He's the most cited American legal scholar. Oh, boys. Nope. 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 He's in the White House now. He's in the White House now. And he was a lawyer? He was a Harvard Law School professor, yes. Jerry, Jerry, Nope. Nope. If somebody would Google Repub the book republic.com, it would be that. We've heard a lot about this internet. <laughs> a room full of internet uh, experts. Okay. Sunstein. Woo! We have a winner. You, sir, may have my tie. <laughs> you may have my tie. Congratulations. So um, that's, that's the fear, and it's a real fear. 
we should, I think, thoroughly, because it seems there's pretty good evidence that human beings, maybe by DNA, maybe by brain structure, we do prefer to hang out with people who we agree with. That should concern us. We need to work against this as individuals, as parents, within our institutions, on our websites, and our, our website's policies for returning results. Uh, all of this is true, and we sh I thoroughly believe we, sh we need to be constantly vigilant. The question is, how deep does this run? And I think that there are some assumptions made by some people who are concerned about uh, the echo chamber argument more than I am that need questioning. I'll just point to one. So this is actually, there's an enlightenment belief that goes directly with the Moynihan quote that a real conversation Oh, let me go like this. I, I was talking with somebody earlier today who apologized because he's a liberal. And I'll tell you, I'm you know, from Boston. Boston Jew, you basically know everything about my politics already. <laughs> I'm totally stereotypical. Um, and it, it, he, w he said that, uh, you know, uh, my news, most of my news I get from MSNBC, and I, I never watch Fox because I, and I, and I know I'm a bad person that I don't watch Fox. I watch both, and I'm committed. To, I'm only getting my news through this filtered source. And I'm saying, what has happened? So I didn't see uh, the State of the Union last night. Um, so when I wanted to read about it, I went to Daily Coast, which is a democratic site, unabashed, you know, it's politi highly political partisan site, because I like their commentary and because I, w I don't want, to, for me to understand what's going on, the contextualization that I need, I don't want to at first have to argue about whether deficits are in fact bad when you have, when you're in a recession. That, you know, deficit, deficit fighting is the key thing. I don't believe, I don't want to talk about this with you at all, but I don't believe that. And it doesn't help me when I'm trying to understand what worked and didn't work and what Obama said in the speech to have to have that argument. I don't want to go to Fox, it's not helpful. I want to go to Daily Coast because we share a basic starting point. And understanding is always the appropriation of the new into what's already there. It's never this radical um, sit down, I'm, I'm going to sit down. So here's the Enlightenment ideal. I'm going to sit down with a Nazi, a neo-Nazi, and we're going to talk. And we're going to look at the facts. So it's sort of barely possible. But the second part of this is, and I'm going to be open to change. I'm going to say, you know, my friend, I'm so glad we can talk and review the facts. And I have to tell you, I am as open to becoming a Nazi as I hope you are open to becoming a Jew. This is not a plausible conversation. It has never happened. It never, sh I, I never should happen. It's never going to happen. It's, it's not how conversation works. It's not how knowledge works, understanding works. It, it so thoroughly misunderstands the nature of conversation. The conversation and understanding, both, are iterations over tiny differences. In order for two people to talk, a Republican and a Democrat, let's just forget the Jew and the Nazi, Republican and Democrat, in order for them to talk, they have to have 99.9% .9 in common. You are a nihilist. You huh? Are a nihilist. I'm sorry, what? You are a nihilist. Well, we'll come back to that. <laughs> I don't, I'm not drawing that conclusion at all. So we have to be speaking the same language, or literally speaking the same language, and that's already 99%. There's so much baked into language. We have to care about the same topics, right? which is what we do in small talk. We sort of angle till we find a safe topic we can talk about. So we have to agree about a topic and agree that it's interesting enough to, to talk about. We have to have a huge agreement about the norms of conversation. How often do we go back and forth? You know, if, if I just monopolize the conversation the way that I am now, you'll leave very, very quickly. Norms of conversation, very subtle. We all understand them, very nuanced. That's another, you know, that's already taking us to 99.9. .9. Same, some basic set of values. That's the only way we can have a conversation. We, conversation and understanding are small iterations over a huge mass of agreement, of sameness. And so the, the basic premise of some of the echo chamber, uh, people who support the echo chamber, or worry overly about the echo chamber um, idea, some of those premises seem to me to be based upon an idea of understanding and conversation that has nothing to do with how those things really work. As if the only good conversation is between the Jew and the Nazi, and the only responsible thing to do is, if you're a Democrat, is to watch Fox News half the time. <laughs> and, if you're, and be open to it. You know? I do watch Fox News on occasion. I'm sorry, I make no assumptions about your politics. I'm just saying. I watch Fox News on occasion, but I do it as an anthropologist. 
I want to know what those people are saying. And I assume the same thing goes with other people watching MSNBC or The Daily Show. Or so anyway, that, I, I didn't want to get involved in this, but I did. There's a huge number of questions about how to evaluate it. But okay, so the fourth and final, fourth, not the four. We'll say final. We'll say fourth, maybe third. Anyway, is um, the internet is is unstructured, and I think that's happening to knowledge as well. So we've had this idea that the pe when we are engaged traditionally in this pursuit of knowledge in which we, if we're lucky, we can contribute a little piece. And those pieces go together and gradually over time we get a better and better representation of the world. A multi-generational uh, task. Quite noble, actually. And so Charles Darwin, in, starting in 1846 for seven years, examined one fact. Whether barnacles were mollusks, as Linnaeus had said, or whether they were, were in fact crustaceans. Where in the natural order do they fit? Seven years dissecting barnacles, coming home every day, going to the dinner table, smelling like dead seafood. And he discovered that, in fact, they, they are crustaceans. And he wrote a two-volume work, thick, totally unreadable, exact opposite of On the Origin of Species, which is a masterpiece of long-form writing. That's what facts look like in the 19th century. Hard ones, scarce, a manly pursuit, and, and firm and done, nailed down, rare, gem-like. So now we're in the age of big data, in which we have this remark these remarkable data commons emerging um, in field after field after field. Uh, genetics, there was an article yesterday, a post yesterday, that we are, in two, within two years, we're likely to have an exabyte of genetic, of genomic information. That's, it's not a, not a terabyte or a petabyte, it's an exabyte just within this one field. Huge, and genetics has been one of the fields that's been making most of its data available. Astronomy, government, libraries are releasing these gigantic clouds of information, creating this, something new on the planet, data commons, that anybody can uh, set a computer trolling through. This is, this, is, this is changing a lot. It's changing, it's opening up fields of research that were otherwise closed. So if I say this is a paradigm shift, I actually mean this in the technical sense, in, in the Kuhn's uh, structure of scientific revolution sense. I mean, that's where, that's where the paradigm shift phrase came from, as, as I'm sure you know. This is, a, this is a paradigm shift. This is the fourth paradigm, I think, what's his name called it. And I'm, don't even bother Googling it. I, it's totally gone now. <laughs> so um, one of the things that's remarkable about this is at the, at the, at the basic sort of atomic level of, of knowledge had been facts. Now it's, it's data, and the data that's being released into, large, into these large clouds are thoroughly different than the nature of facts were. Facts were gem-like, brick-like. Uh, they, they were bricks. In the classic formulation, they were bricks that you build things out of one at a time. Mm. Got it. Next one. It's not the way data works in the world of big data. Uh, is everybody, uh, are people familiar with link, the linked data standard? Uh, raise your hand if you are, because otherwise I'm about to get slightly tedious. I'm going to get tedious anyway. Okay, I'll, I'll be. I'll, you'll know what I'm talking about quickly. Um, so, the link data standard has uh, been put forward by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who gave us, you know, the web for free, no copyright, no patent, and it's very simple. It's actually quite brilliant. So the idea is that you take your data and you release it in triples, two things with a relation in between. This is actually, I don't know if. Berners-Lee knows that this is a classic Aristotelian notion, okay? but it doesn't matter. You do these triples, <laughs> and now you want, and you want computers to be able to go through these clouds and hook things together and find us, uh, connections we didn't know that were there. I'm going to give you some examples from the library world where there are some astounding possibilities that are now becoming possible by trolling through fields of data from multiple disciplines. Okay. So you do this, but computers don't know that a platypus is a water mole, is a ornithorhynchus, whatever. So when you do these triples, the right way to do them is to uh, link. Each of these elements should be a link to some public resource. And there's, there's no, no council telling you what those resources should be, so you're just trying to make good decisions. And so maybe for platypus, what you do is put, into a, put a link into the Encyclopedia of Life page. And let's say that other group that released information 
put in the same link. Now a computer knows. Talking about the same thing, thus the computer can conclude the platypus lays eggs. The platypus that lives in Tasmania lays eggs. But this third one down here, now they didn't link to Encyclopedia of Life, they linked to the Tasmanian Field Guide, which I made up. <laughs> but somebody will relatively quickly probably do a mapping and say, you know what the TF, what the Encyclopedia of Life, that page, that's actually pointing the same thing as this page in the TFG. And once that happens in a computer readable form, then this cloud also becomes usable. The computer can find it and make sense of it. This, uh, when this happens across, what happens within the field is quite marvelous. When it happens across fields, it is, can be astounding and close to miraculous. We can have now the ability to start pulling together information from all over. These, these data consist of links. Facts are bricks. The whole point is they stand on their own. These are, at their heart, they are links and pointers. It is a thoroughly, they are made to be connected. There we go. Um, this sort of um, change in, in structure is happening at the macro level as well, and it's the last thing I want to say. So we have in our culture, throughout our, our 2,500 years of history, we like a particular form of knowledge connection. We like long-form argument. We think that stringing together a set of uh, premises and walking deductively or through careful evidence all the way, carrying a reader all the way to, to the end, to the conclusion, is the highest. This is godlike. This is where we are made in our maker's image. And when we do that, not just unearth facts, but put them together in these beautiful change, a, chains, as in uh, Origin of Species. Um, we are now duplicating what God did in creating the universe. That's the way that we've thought about it. It's that serious. It's as if God thinks in long chains of, of thought. <laughs> so I, I am not saying, especially as the author of the book, that uh, books are going away, long form books are going away, but I cert and that we're only gonna have you know, little snippets of, of Darwin would be tweeting. And <laughs> <laughs> long form is, is a beautiful aesthetic form and it's satisfying in the way that narrative is satisfying. So I think it will stick around, but it sure seems to me that it is very rapidly losing its preeminence in our culture as this is the pinnacle of human thinking. I, don't th I think that's pretty much gone. That is that notion which some people my age still hold to and write books for, that, is, that idea is rapidly um, going away, that it is the preeminent way of doing it. So if Darwin were working now, or today's Darwin, she or he would very, very likely be working online, of course. And maybe would be tweeting from the, from the Beagle and, and blogging the idea. I just had this crazy idea and people would write a comment. Have you, have you noticed that those Finch, I was on Flickr and I noticed that then there's, now it's all geocoded, those Finch beaks seem awfully peculiar to me. What do you think about it? And you know, would be responding to that. And so the development of the theory would occur online among people who support his sources, uh, people who support him, who extend it, who raise objections, who bring up new ideas, who apply it to new fields, who deny what he says, contradict them, get him wrong, explain him, this is a really important thing, explaining him to many others who don't have the, the uh, competency within, um, within that field, and be, be commercialized by travel agents who are selling the, you know, the tour of the Galapagos. See the finch beaks, just as, experience the finch beaks just as Darwin did. If you want a real life example of this, I'm going to borrow an example from uh, Michael Nielsen, whose book Reinventing Discovery about the networking of science. It's really, really good book. He gave a talk at the center that I'm at last month, and he gave the following example. Um, not exactly as I'm about to, so, so I'm going to get it wrong. He got it right. So he, he pointed to the um, faster than light neutrino um, controversy, right? Data may be upsetting all of relativity theory, gets posted. Uh, gets posted at archive.org, which is a site for uh, pre-print. That is, sci any scientist can post there before an article has been sent out for peer review. It's a non-peer reviewed site. Anybody can post there. So these findings, these remarkable and important findings that posted there, 
and over the course of the next two months, another 80 papers get posted there, and, and it spreads out all over the web. And it's people who are explaining it and coming up with their own hypotheses and, and uh, uh, arguing back and forth, and it's amateurs and it's professionals and the distinction, is, and tons of explainers who are explaining this, sometimes in great detail, to people who, like me, don't have the slightest ability to actually understand it. This is, this is a remarkable and important thing. Um, in the past, they would have submitted this to a peer-reviewed journal on paper. It would have taken a year and a half. It then would have come a flurry of letters another six months later. Maybe there'd be a couple of articles in a newspaper, and if you wanted to pursue it further, you couldn't. Maybe, maybe you go to the library if you're really interested and start thumbing through some journals, but very difficult. Now, whatever level of understanding you're at, you can participate in this. You can understand it. It will be explained to you. There's somebody who's going to answer your question. The point is not only that this is how knowledge scales. This is how knowledge scales. The paper-based way just isn't fast enough. It doesn't involve enough people. There isn't enough space or time for all the ideas. This is how you scale knowledge. But this is also where knowledge lives. If we, in the past, thought that knowledge lived in books, which basically it did, that made sense. In exactly the same sense, knowledge now lives in this network. There, no node in the network, whether it's the original article or it's the magnificent origin of species, long form work. Um, no node in this network is as valuable as the network itself. It's that network of disagreement and difference that adds the value to knowledge that enables it to scale the way that we want it to. So final, um, finally back to this question, which is why did our institutions of knowledge fall over? And I can see that in my last minute haste I have screwed up this, but we'll just ignore that. So here's the point. <coughs> Imagine, if you will, the characteristics of knowledge that um, have guided us for 2,500 years, that it's settled, that it's, um, it's scarce, it's highly scarce, it's gem-like, that, um, that it's orderly and clean and perfect and beautiful in its organization. Um, these have given way to another set of characteristics that we've been talking about, that it's unbounded and, and it's absolutely overwhelming, it's unsettled, it's always unsettled, it's amazingly messy and thus rich with meaning, that it's linked all the way down to its core, that it's, it's built, it's literally built out of links. Those characteristics are characteristics of the internet, I believe they are becoming characteristics of knowledge, but the key thing is that they are also characteristics of what it is to be human, to live on this earth as a human being. We are incredibly finite and limited. We don't agree. We are unsettled. We are messy in how we live through our lives, mentally, um, not just physically as some of us are. So two very brief conclusions. The first is that network knowledge may or may not be truer than uh, truer about the world. I think that ultimately it is. And overall, we now are knowing more true things than ever before. But put that to the side. We can argue about that. It may or may not be truer about the world, but it is truer about what it means to know something. It is truer to the nature of knowing. The, and that's one reason why the old institutions fell over so quickly. It's because there was something that we recognize sort of false and, and inhuman about them. We couldn't be objective. Objectivity was never really something that humans can do. We couldn't know enough. We couldn't settle things forever. We couldn't be certain. We couldn't order the world in one simple way and see it only that way. All of these things were noble fictions that we told ourselves because that's how that's the, what the medium that we had gave us. That's what we could do. That's all the knowledge we can handle. It's how we had to handle the knowledge because it was bound to the physical. The second, but we knew that all along. So when another possibility opened up, we. We ran to it. And the second conclusion is what, the Enlightenment was wrong. The promise of, of knowledge is not going to be fulfilled. What we have in common is not one knowledge about which we all agree. It's just not going to happen, much as we would like it to. The best that we have is a shared world about which we disagree. And we either get better at disagreeing um, peacefully and productively, or the human project will fail. But there's I am slightly optimistic that we, that because our new way of knowing is closer to our actual human situation, that we will manage to live together in, in a peace, but in a very, very noisy peace. Thanks.
Questions? Oh, I don't black, take questions. Black no questions. Black no questions. Right there. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> questions? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> right, Jay, Jay. What's the school system? How do you change the school system? Does the school change the school system? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, you already know that, right? Because you know that uh, there's already this. Whole school. Uh, but you know the kids are not. And so inevitably, they're going to be teaching. And they will not be saying, write a report but only use three sources from the internet. They're not going to be saying that. They're going to be doing what all of us do, which is go on the internet. And we hope, there's something we need to do, we hope that as teach them, um, that they will use the internet wisely and learn the way that most of us have, how not to be fooled at least all the time by all the crap and lies on the internet. So there's that. We are in this <laughs> scary cultural crisis in which we have a generation that's growing up collaboratively, uh, believing that, that knowledge, uh, that education should be something public. Um, and then we have increasing no child left behind measurement spanking. <laughs> the two things are absolutely in crisis now. So I'll say one more thing, because you're a bunch of you're a bunch of techies, and a whole bunch of you either are software developers or work with software developers. Is that correct? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So if you are, let's ignore reality. That's fine with me. So let's pretend that you are. Then you know that the um, educational system that software developers have built for themselves, uh, distributed, just you know, piece by piece. The way in which software developers learn, get questions answered, um, reuse code, is probably the fastest learning envi environment humans have ever created. If you have a software development developer and you have a problem or you need to extend your knowledge, Google, boom, done. You're on some site where not only are they explaining it, and multiple people are explaining it, and they're arguing and they're perfecting their answer, they are also posting the code that you want. The key thing here is, I think, and I don't think developers think about it this way, um, maybe they do, is that learning ought to be a public activity. We, the way we've structured education now is that um, I'm a teacher, there's a student, I improve the student. And therefore the student goes out and improves society because it's, you know, she or he's a better student. That's, that's fine, but that's essentially a selfish act. I'm making that student better. The software developers and many, many, many others on the web act as if education should be a public act that in the act of, of learning, you are improving the public sphere. Not indirectly by improving the person, but in the act of learning. And that's exactly what developers do. They answer the question fully and they post the code. We all just got smarter. That's, I, I think that's a, a wonderful model in many instances. And because of that, I hope and think that it'll, it'll catch on. And that'll, you know, the, the natural instinct to share and to improve, uh, to be beneficent, to, imp to improve the world simply by learning that that is very appealing to students as well as to you know, the rest of us. Um, I am bad at calling on people. Over there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but there's still a paradox in what you're talking about, which has bothered me for a while now, which is this notion that, that all facts are now debatable. Right, there is no objective reality. Uh, so, no, I didn't so, say that, but keep going. But, okay. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's different than, than the model of, of using code where it's, where it's going to run or it's not going to run, right? Yeah. But, but now all of a sudden, uh, Obama's a Muslim or, 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 or the world is flat or whatever piece of nonsense that is out there seems to grow legs, and it seems paradoxical to me in this glut of more information, especially in in sort of open source society where it's supposed to be quickly corrected. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to clear myself on a technicality and leave you with no hope. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be in the clear and that's really all that matters. <laughs> all right, so I personally, I believe, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it, I'd, I'd quibble over objective reality, but we're saying the right. same thing. The world is one way and it's not another. Obama was not born in Kenya right. and getting vaccinated does not cause autism. Right. And, you know, there are, there are truths. My point is, we're not going to agree on them. That's the fact. Even though some things are right and some things are wrong and we need to continue to bend every effort to discover what's right and what's not and to build policy on it, I, I completely favor fact-based policy. We have lived through 
years of non fact based policy, and it's not good. You've been watching the Republican debates. I haven't announced my, my politics, I want to go no further. Um, all, all, it, all that I'm saying is it doesn't matter. Those facts are not going to bring us to agreement. So we still have to pursue them. We're just not, it's not going to get settled. And that, that fact to me is profoundly unsettling un, and unhappy. Can, can you envision a time, maybe 100 years from now, 150 years from now, whatever comes after the internet, there's some source of truth out there that yeah. allows us, you know, the Nazi and the Jew to sit down and say, okay, this is reality, uh, and now we have a common understanding of things. So could we ever get there? Uh, well, uh, so soaps. Soaps. Dot com. <laughs> I'm sorry, what is it? Soaps. You know, the one that debunks oh, all yeah, the yeah, Well, no, that's, that's, that's Snopes dot com is exactly where it's going. So, um, so it's a little bit like the old joke about artificial intelligence that as soon as it works, it no longer looks like artificial intelligence. It's no longer called that, and so that's why we don't have it. But that if somebody saw Siri today, or even sort of the uh, enemy behavior in, in video games and <laughs> from 20 years ago, they'd say, you solved it, you've got AI. The same thing with knowledge, and as soon as it gets settled, then it stops, it sort of falls beneath the radar, and we take it, and I'm certainly, by the way, in this talk, completely guilty of pushing things beneath the radar this way. So that um, when almanacs became a phenomenon in the mid-19th mid century, they were a way of gathering some basic facts, commoditizing them so that reporters could just look them up and get the population of Cleveland without having to go down to the Census Bureau and get the information. Very handy, really useful thing to do. We've done the same thing with the search engines now, so that when I can't remember cast Sunstein's name, you instantly can respond. You look it up and you have it in seconds. Instantly. Yeah, or whatever. <laughs> Um, and so we've come out, the fact that, you know, you're at the dinner table and you're having a discussion and you're going like this and say, well, no, I actually think it was Cass Sunstein that you're referring to. <laughs> it's, it's a big step forward, right? We have all that, stuff. we've commoditized another layer of, of thought. And Wikipedia has commoditized yet one level up in a way that we, nobody would have predicted. We had encyclopedia articles, but there was no idea that encyclopedia articles could ever cover all topics were, you know, such a wide swath of topics. We had 3.8 million English Wikipedia articles. The old Britannica was 65,000 uh, articles. I mean, I, you know, so we've commoditized the level of the um, encyclopedia article, a huge swath of, of knowledge. And so we agree enough on that that it forms a baseline. And you can always disagree with the encyclopedia or with Britannica or whatever, but there's still this base, referential baseline that we have that we didn't have before that advances the game. So you may end up disagreeing about it, but most times you'll settle the issue by saying, well, no, Wikipedia says that Sunstein actually is not in the Obama White House. He was in the past White House or whatever. And you say, oh, okay, sorry, I was wrong. So we, keep, we have so much more knowledge now. We're com we've commoditized it. We've pushed it down a layer of consciousness, but it's there. And that makes us much, um, much smarter. We've externalized uh, another layer of, of knowledge. So, I don't think there will be a time when, when somebody will be, the interesting and controversial questions will be answered by some, by a Snopes. But we will continue to invent Snopes-like things to handle knowledge that can be settled, sufficiently settled and commoditized. And that's really good news. Next question. People lament the loss of the Edward R. Murrow curation of news. In this new world of information overload where you know, there's not too much information, you just need better filters. To what extent do you see curation as a viable filter? And does curation become more important, or does it go away? I, would, I, I think the opposite of going away. Um, there's so many, so, so many more curators. You know, it's commonplace. Everybody's a curator. We all do it all the time. Um, few of us are as good as Edward R. Morrow. But, you know, I think there's a... Uh, I hate to say this, but I think there's an argument that Edward R. Murrow, um, his value, we shouldn't get stuck on this example, right? But Because it's just an example. Well, Brit Britannica or Salzburg or whomever the curator is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right here. <coughs> he, he's right behind you, you know. Salzburg, what would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> um, there, so you lose a, um, a forced <laughs> consensus. There's so few outlets. Everybody, you only have, I grew up there, three TV right. stations, right? And everybody watches Edward R. Murrow. But that was a lie, of course. Actually, a minority of the country watched them. And you know, nevertheless, everybody watches Edward R. Murrow. 
Um, we had to because we only had three channels, and wrestling was on the other two, so that was the <laughs> choice. Um, that type of consensus is, has its advantages, and it has huge disadvantages. The news, we, we know that for, for forever, our curators were, in essence, white male censors. Well-intentioned censors, with the best of intentions, but that's, when you only have a handful of curators, there is no distinction. Boy, I've never said this, and I'm sure I'm gonna regret, <laughs> regret seeing it tweeted. That the different when you have so few um, curators, the difference there is no difference between curation and censorship. And what? And censorship. Is that right? It's a nice overstatement, but I'm not sure it's true. Yes, it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we have so many, we have a different set of problems, and they're real problems. But it, we don't have that one. I have to say, Salzberger's Sol okay. hand is up higher than anybody else's. Let me, let me, let me. I, I, I've got too much to say, and I don't want to derail things. So leave aside the issue of 62. Yeah. Um, 62? Yes. Yeah. We'll leave aside the issue of 62. All right. Oh, it's back. It's back. But, but let's let's actually go back to the example of my cousins. <laughs> Holy cow! Who run the New York Times I'm sorry. and Edward R. Murrow versus today. In, in the days, say, 1960, before the internet, um, there were several considered serious newspapers in New York. City. They differed far more fundamentally than MSNBC and Fox News do on all the issues on which those two differ today. They differed so much more that it's hard for, I think, people who weren't alive then to understand. Um, and it is simply not true. It, it, look, we're talking about the entire world, we're talking about very general things. So it, it's very hard to actually tell the truth in a our talk. But, but, but really, things have narrowed incredibly with regard to what it's okay to say in public that will be read by 100 million people. It's narrowed to a degree almost inconceivable to those who can remember the older world. Now, I think the internet may indeed lead to an opening up, but at the moment it hasn't, and I will come to 62. <laughs> Who filters what for what purpose, and what do they filter out getting to whom? We face the prospect of the end of the right of private ownership of computers today. Everybody who carries around an iPhone or an iPad has not seized root, has formally, explicitly, practically, whether it's formally legal or not, once it might have made a difference, but not in today's USA, you've given up absolutely all rights anything you do in that machine. Apple can and does read each and every one of your emails you send via your Sir, iPad. what's your question? What's my question? Yes. I'm ranting. Wait, 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 wait. And, 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 and so this vision of individual filters and freedom to go where you want, it's true today, mostly. Not if you get your information from the net via the iPad. You're not allowed to run anything except approved things unless you see seized root. So it's not true we all have our own filters, or if we do, if we don't fight for them, we'll lose them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it, there's another serious problem as well, which is that even though everybody has, everybody can be their own filter and can be their own Edward R. Murrow, the topology of, the, of networks tends towards a hub and, and you know, hubs it's a long tail issue. Right? Yeah. Hubs form, uh, and m in many instances, those hubs form around traditional uh, economic centers and social centers. And so we see re-emerging on the web many of the old um, oligarchies. And may, that may be inevitable. Um, and we can, because it's the web, we can nevertheless still find uh, people who are, who are not uh, in those centers. But it is a, it is an impediment. Lloyd, let's take one more question and then we'll... I wanted to go back to the Edward R. Murrow thing. It was kind of interesting. If you remember, X number of years ago, Murrow did the expose on McCarthy and ended his career. Why? CBS, trustworthy news organization, broadcast television. Last week on ABC or whatever network it was, Newt Gingrich's wife went out there and basically told the world that this person has the moral integrity of a, you know, dot, dot, dot. And it had 
maybe one pass through the news cycle had nothing, had no discernible impact on Gingrich. And I'm just seeing this dynamic, you know, going back to what you're saying about people don't, you know, we're going to have to accept the fact that we don't disagree, that we, we don't agree, but it just seems to be moving rapidly into this, this fact says this, this fact says this, I have my opinion, I'm not going to change it, and everything is gridlocking. So it doesn't matter if, a, if, if the network says that Gingrich is a philanderer, or there's absolute, complete, total proof that Obama is not a Muslim and was not born, and you still have huge numbers of people saying he is. And you might have had a situation, let's say 20 years ago, where the New York Times and some professors say Obama is not a Muslim, and that more or less erases it. And it just seems to be, through the internet, accelerating a sort of Tower of Babel dynamic. So, uh, yes, but. <laughs> so it's, it's, I find it very hard to know where the causality is. So it certainly does seem the case that the media have lost the ability to be the sort of emergency break that finally gets yanked on, on McCarthy and he gets thrown in. That certainly does seem to be, be the case, but there's an argument, one could argue, and I think, in fact, I think there's some truth to, part of the problem with, say, a Gingrich sort of example, to, we'll accept your value system for the moment, as a, um, is that the media doesn't, it's not the internet, that's solely at fault anyway. It's that the um, the media are, are no longer capable of uh, doing the Jacques moment. What they say is that they want to get both sides, and even when this is a famous, you know, all the critiques that you've heard, um, they provide balance and are un, are too uh, abashed to point out that that other side actually is a pack of lies. They still have to right. report it without comment because they want to be objective. That seems, there seems to me some merit in that criticism of the media, but I don't see that directly as an internet effect. Maybe it is. Because <laughs> so the internet is disintermediating. You point out newspapers, the influence of the New York Times, because of the proliferation of news sources, has you know decreased. So it doesn't yeah, have that. The, the front page article in the New York Times proving, quote unquote, that Obama is not a Muslim doesn't have the same relevance. But they don't have that article. So what happens is, the proof of Obama's citizenship is every every realm, every domain. This is sort of old postmodern stuff, and it's absolutely right. That, um, every domain has its own criteria of what counts as proof. Different in science, different. For the fact that Obama was born in Hawaii and not in Kenya, that standard within that domain was passed a long time ago. There is no evidence on one side. There is all evidence on the other side. And even so, the media, the mainstream media never were willing to say, uh, so-and-so, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Trump. Trump, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Trump, <laughs> Trump that raises the, the issue again. And the media do not say, uh, Trump has raised, again, the lie that they give it enough credence as if it's a belief. Some, two, some there are two media, sides of this. Some media did. Well, but not, the, not but, but the problem very is most few. people get their news now and their information now from the internet and not from standard media. Some standard media is actually... <coughs> yes, that's true. First, first of all, there's, there's a difference between knowledge and current events. I curate my life. We all curate our life. We all make a decision to dress a certain way. Just why, like in politics, Obama decided to curate how he proved whether he was or not born here in a certain way. And that way was, did he really make much, he, he, deci he decided to like relax the issue and not prove anything until a certain guy with a lot of money stirred the pot a little bit. That chose Obama to react with some other actions, not the fact that there was questionability. So the example that you bring up really isn't a knowledge, it doesn't really, the discussion of politics and who's right and who agrees is not really for this forum, because this forum, from what I gathered, and I, they, you did a great job, was, was knowledge that's going to, and the foundation and structure of knowledge that's going to be relevant in a thousand years. Today's politics, CNN, Fox News, is not going to be relevant in a thousand years. 
I'm going to cut us off here. Uh, we're approaching our limit. Uh, so thank you once again for coming. Thank you for the We're going to have some additional cocktails out here. Excellent. There are books for sale that uh, David will be happy to sign. Please buy the books so that he can earn his train ticket back to Boston. Uh, uh, there's plenty out there, and he'll be happy to sign them. And uh, please enjoy. Uh, fill out your surveys, if you would, afterwards, and leave your name tags on the way out. And we hope to see you at the next event.